Hello and welcome to the fifth installment of the Doylestown Democrats Vote Local interview series. I'm Judy Dixon. I'm a committee person with the Doylestown Democrats. Asking our local officials, what exactly do you do, is a starting point to this deeper dive conversation into learning more about local government. So many of us know more about what's going on nationally than we do in our own backyard. Together, a group of Doyle's Ted Democrats put together this interview series. This is your civics lessons, and we hope you enjoy it. Uh, as a note, this series is being recorded and is available on the Doylestown Democrats website and YouTube channel. So tonight we have three row offices with us this evening for Bucks County. And uh, next, next month we are taking the month off. It is the primary, so please get out and vote and support your candidates. But we'll be talking to our row officers in, it in just a little bit. And then we're back again in June. Uh, we're gonna be meeting with uh, State Senator Steve Sanancero and former State Representative Wendy Almond. We hope you can enjoy those and join us for those events. But just a quick roadmap to this evening. So what we'll do is there'll be a brief interview of Bucks County Row Offices, and then we'll have a show and tell with our guests. So we'll do a brief introductions, and our guests tonight have put together a little video to show exactly what they do instead of just telling us. So we hope you enjoy that in, your, in that video. And then we'll ask questions. Bonnie Chang has some questions for us, and you can also put your questions into the Q&A. And lastly, we'll tell you how you can get local and become more engaged. So a little bit about Bucks County Row Offices. There are nine row offices and they are elected for a four year term. Now this is unusual or not quite usual in all states because many states, they are not elected positions, but basically positions by which the business administer uh, appoints these positions. But in Bucks County, they are elected. As specified by Pennsylvania law, these row offices include the clerk of court, controller, coroner, district attorney, prothonotary, recorder of deeds, register of wills, sheriff, and treasurer. Now, you may know more about their services than these actual positions. So you've probably or possibly gone to the courthouse or the administrative building to get a passport, a marriage license, a death certificate, a military discharge record, or a firearms registration. These are all services provided by these row officers. And it's good to know that their, their space and allotment does come from the Bucks County commissioners, but they do function independently of the Bucks County commissioners. So we'll go over introductions to our three row officers that have kindly joined us this evening. Uh, we are gonna start out with Neil. Uh, Neil was born and raised in New Hope, Pennsylvania, and he returned to the community after graduating from the University of Pennsylvania. Prior to be a, being elected Bucks County Controller in 2017, Neil served on the New Hope Solberry School Board, and he was the board president and chaired the finance committee there. Before becoming the County Controller in 2018, Neil had a 15 year career in financial services and commercial insurance with Federated Mutual Insurance. Neil lives in Solberry with his wife, two children, two dogs, and two moon, uh, Maine Coon cats. So Neil, we have your video ready to show and uh, we're excited to show that. Is there anything you wanna say about your video before we, before we tee it up and get it started? Uh, I feel like we touched all the bases in the controller's office. I feel like we hit our major responsibilities. The one thing I didn't mention that I want to add in is the uh, pension. So the Bucks County Retirement Plan is something, um, it's a board that I sit on, and that's something I take a keen interest in. And uh, that's a pension by statute, but it's important that we keep it fully funded because it takes pressure off the rest of the budget. But other than that, I feel like we covered it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thanks. I enjoyed recording this video with you. So, um, uh, Carl, if you want to help us out here. Come on in. Welcome to the controller's office. 
Hi, I'm Neil Doherty. I'm the Bucks County Controller. I have been in office for three years, and um, one item we work on is the CAFR. This is the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. We prepare this for the county, and we hand copies of this to the commissioner. This is a summary of the prior year finances, and this is an essential um, report because the credit agencies use this. Essentially, it's our report card to determine our credit worthiness. And this is a real laborious undertaking and we work on it throughout the spring and wrap it up before June 30th. So I have an office uh, here on the fifth floor. I call it the courthouse and um, commissioners are in the rotunda on the fifth floor. Tax claims and treasurer, they're also on the fifth floor. And um, some of the things I have in my office, well, sailboat photo by Anna Vanderwall, cuckoo clock. Those are places my wife and I and children like to travel. There's my diploma from UPenn. And this is um, at my father did back in um, the early 60s. And then from my view, on a clear day, you can see all the way down to Philadelphia. And you can see the Philly skyline. Now in November, we saw people lining up all the way around the block to vote in person, which was pretty inspiring. So we're responsible for accounts payable. The count, we receive about 100,000 invoices annually that we take care of for the county. Here is an absolute workhorse. We give her a stack of paper this high and it just goes down like that. <laughs> Invaluable. So are you actually creating the invoices or are you paying the invoices? We're receiving them. Yes. You're receiving them from the vendors and then you pay them for the county. Yes. So what kind of invoices might you receive? Oh, these are from contractors. These are from suppliers. These are services. Janitorial. I mean, I think that might be fourteen hundred a day. Oh wow, yeah. fourteen hundred invoices a day. Pretty, pretty, uh, pretty long list. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. oh. Another service we provide for the county is we take care of payroll. So we are processing payroll for around twenty five hundred county employees biweekly. So the department submits their payroll to us here in the controller's office. We verify the information. We process it and any deductions that go with it and third party deductions and then it's submitted to the treasurer department for uh, check printing and direct deposits. This is Kelly. I call Kelly our air traffic controller. Hi Kelly. Um, you. Unlike some other county offices, we aren't really um, interacting with the public much, but one group of people we do take care of are retirees. So we have county employees who are on the cusp of retirement. They come here and they meet with our retirement specialist, CJ, so they can get a more accurate picture of what to expect in retirement. We also process 1,650 retirement checks a month for county retirees. Uh, here in the controller's office, we have the authority and responsibility to audit. So we audit tax collectors, district courts. We have the authority to audit the other row offices and departments. And um, you know, they, various, they, they, they vary in scope and scale. So for example, a tax collector, that could be anywhere from 75 to 125 hours, um, whereas a row office might be 1,800 to 2,200 hours um, and a much deeper and much more comprehensive report. We uh, prepare those audits and we post them on the website. And that is, you know, that's transparency for the taxpayer. They can go see how their tax collector is performing they can look at um, row offices and see our reports and our audits on how they're performing. And um, they're also informative for the office holders. So they are, uh, they can give them a, a textbook by which to uh, improve. So um, that is kind of a department within itself, within the controller's office, but one of our most important um, long-term operations. Thanks. Okay. Okay, well, thanks. I hope you enjoyed that video and got a better understanding of uh, Neil's role or the controller's role for Bucks County. Uh, next up, we have Robin Robinson, who is our recorder of deeds. Robin Robinson was sworn in as recorder of deeds in January of 2018. Prior to being recorder of deeds, she worked with the commissioner's office for 10 years and served one term as the Bucks County jury commissioner. In her personal time, Robin volunteers with Safe Harbor, a program for children who have lost parents, and with Cat Rescue, Rescue Perfect in Ben Salem. Her community involvement led her to receive the 2020 YWCA Woman of the Year Award. She has lived in Bucks County for almost 21 years and now lives in Warwick Township 
with her two children and their rescue dog, Lily. Robin, any uh, words for us that you want to tee up to start off your video? Well, does everyone just love that picture of me there with my mouth open? And, you know, I guess I just talk a lot, you know, so, but anyway, I have a lot to say. I love being the recorder of deeds. I'm honored to be able to serve. I've made lots of changes and I want to tell everyone that my main responsibility according to state law is to maintain and protect the record of this county and i am doing just that and more as you'll get a little taste of things from my video oh well thank you and your daughter did help you with this video is that right oh yes my daughter made the video we got it we got to give some shout out there <laughs> All right, terrific. Let's let's let, let it roll. I'm Robin Robinson, your recorder of deeds of Bucks County. As the recorder of deeds, it is my main job to maintain and protect the record of this county. So in April 2018, when I discovered our historic deed books on the floor of the county warehouse, falling apart, crumbling, and almost dead, I took it upon myself to start a preservation program to preserve protect and maintain the record of this county and save the treasure, our historic deed books. We're able to maintain and protect the record with allocated funds given to our office, plus our adoptive book program I started and through grants. We're not putting those books back on that warehouse floor. We're putting them in a beautiful new storage area that is in the administration building. These books are gonna last for 500 years. And I hope when this pandemic is over that you'll all have the chance to come in and visit and thumb through the pages of Bucks County history with us. Hi, I'm Robin Robinson, your recorder of Deeds of Bucks County. This is my mother, uh, Harriet Robinson. She was one of the first women to join the United States Army in World War II. I wanted to tell you a little bit today about recording veterans discharge papers. We do this free of charge and it's really important. So when you are looking for your discharge papers or your family members need it, you can call our office and we'll have that for you. So please, to all the veterans out there, make a copy of your discharge papers, your DD-214, and send it in to us at the address on the screen, and we will record it free of charge, and it will be there for whenever you need it. I'm Robin Robinson, the recorder of Deeds of Bucks County. In order to help protect all of us against identity theft, we have a new fraud alert system in the Recorder of Deeds office. If anybody, once you're signed up, if anybody records anything in your name in our office, you'll get an alert either by text or by email. This is a free service and I hope you'll take advantage of it and sign up with me today for the Bucks County Fraud Alert System. Oh, that was terrific. Thanks for those videos. They were great, Robin. And our last uh, row officer with us this evening is Judy Reese Prasonitary. Uh, Judy is a 45 year resident of Lower Makefield Township. Both she and her husband, Gary, have been involved in community activities and projects while raising their five children. Judy was active in Edgewood PTO, was a Cub Scout leader and on the board of directors at Abrams Hebrew Academy. She was a teacher in Trenton Public Schools. Judy has delivered Meals on Wheels and volunteered for several years at the Greenwood House for the Aged. Sadly, Judy lost her son Joshua at the World Trade Center. Judy has worked with other local victims' family to help establish the Garden of Reflection and other events for remembrance. Judy is a past board member of the Environmental Advisory Council in Lower Makefield and was elected to serve on the Board of Supervisors. In November 2017, Judy was elected Bucks County Prothonotary. Judy and Gary are in their same home where they raised their children and now have two dogs, Rosie and Max. So Judy, is there anything you'd like to say to tee up your video before we get it started? Well, the Prothonotary was the first office that was formed by William Penn in 1683. And the prothonotary means first notary, and it is our job to keep the records of all court cases. 
but that also includes keeping records from the coroner, the sheriff's office, something. I, I work with Robin a lot with notaries and other things that, you know, that kind of overlap. So we kind of overlap with most of the other offices in the county. We all overlap very little, but somewhat with the clerk of courts. Clerk of courts is criminal, I'm civil and family, but occasionally when you get contempt, it ends up being criminal. So we kind of overlap. So it's, okay. it's, an int it's very interesting and I enjoy my job. Yes, well, thank you so much. And uh, here's the video that we put together. Hi, I'm Judy Reese and I'm the Bucks County Prothonotary. For people who do not know what a prothonotary is, it is the chief clerk and elected position of the Court of Common Pleas and the Family Courts for Bucks County. Each county in Pennsylvania has an elected prothonotary. This is my office. Um, I'm usually not in it. I'm usually out where everyone else is. And you're, everyone is welcome to come in anytime they like. Did you work through COVID or how, what yes, happened there? Yes, our office, I'm proud to say, remained open and fully functioning during COVID. We were able to use funds from the COVID relief fund to get more laptops, computers. So during the worst few months, we had people working in teams so that the whole office wasn't in at one time. They could work remotely using their computers for the e-filing, answering phones, answering questions, walking people through what they need to do. And that kept us open and functioning. And I think that was very important. We were still doing protection from abuse almost on a daily basis. I will say we pretty much stayed level until about two weeks after Christmas, mid-January, we've seen a spike in people requesting for, you know, protection from abuse. I believe the pandemic truly has um, strained people. This is the office of the Family Prothonotary. It includes family court, custody and visitation, divorce, and protection from abuse. Protection from abuse must be filed in person in the state of Pennsylvania. And right now during COVID, we're only allowing one person at a time in the lobby as it's a small area. The reason we have a separate door is for privacy and security. It is important that we're here. Uh, judges are always here to hear those cases immediately. And we are able to um, get them to a judge same day. We do ask that people, the judges ask that you be here by 1.30 if it is after 1.30 or at night, you call your sheriff or you go and they will take you to a magistrate. The magistrates will give you a temporary order that will last until the next business day. So if it's a Friday afternoon, the next business day would be you need to be up at the courthouse in Doylestown on Monday. Also, we are a United States Department of State passport agency and when you enter the office the first place you come is the passport counter. The first Bucks County Monetary was in 1683. The older books are in various historical libraries but we do have a, a record where they're kept and they're kept there to keep them in climate control and very little light so they don't decay. On my desk here is a copy of one of our books. This is a divorce book. And you can see the different handwritings from the different prothonotaries. And this one, I believe this page starts in 1862. And we keep books, many of these books we are asked to, to use on various occasions for people looking up information. The office provides computers for looking up civil cases on the Bucks County Viewer. On the viewer, you can find all the cases who have been scanned to an internet facility. We are working on getting all of our microfilm and microfiche scanned to the viewer. This is where family court matters are held. Divorce, again, custody, visitation, and protection from abuse. Those that come in by mail or at the counter, we scan into the viewer. 
This is what our judges want because they want things on paper rather than looking at the viewer. This is just an example of some cases that will be going up to the judge probably today. This book and one other that's kind of it's made were returned to us by the Spruids as they have begun to have mold. So we need to have this book put taken to a restoring service and so it can be restored. And you will see that this book begins in, this is 1893, and this is a sheriff's deeds. Some of these are, um, these were all sheriff sales. We keep records of the sheriff sales going back, and these are all the ones, this goes, from about 1892 and it does need restoring. When it's restored, they will recover it and each page will be encased in, I guess, a plastic to keep it more air secure so that it won't deteriorate any further. Okay. Well, thanks, Neil, Judy, and Robin. Thanks for putting together those videos with us. We really appreciated y'all doing that, and I hope um, the audience appreciated just kind of a, getting to see your offices. I think that was a lot of fun. So, Bonnie, I'm going to hand it over to you to start with uh, some questions, and everyone can put their questions into Q&A. Okay. Thank you. You're muted. Sorry. Um, <laughs> today's Q&A session is, is going to be done a little differently uh, because the three row officers, um, they each have very different function. So we're going to break it into two portions. The first portion is that we will ask individual row officers about their operations and their accomplishments. And then um, halfway through, we will then ask a, um, a question that applies to all three of them. So um, again, as Judy mentioned that, please put your questions in the Q&A because we can't follow the chat. And if you have questions, you know, we have to sort of screen through it. So if you have questions, put in Q&A and uh, Judy Dixon will ask the questions for you. So we're gonna start with the individual questions and um, we're gonna start with Neil. And I have been accused of giving really hard questions to go, uh, to start with. So today I learned, so I'm gonna ask Neil, what is the role of the controller that you enjoy the most? <laughs> oh, the range of things that we cover. We, we have a hand in every department in the county. Um, so, you know, even though we're up there on the fifth floor, I love that we touch all aspects of the county and the county departments. So um, it's just so far reaching. We, we have a hand in every element of county business. That much, that's the part I like the most. Wow, so you get to know almost every aspect of the county government. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's really good. And you should if write a book. If you're curious like I am, it's, it's incredibly um, enriching and rewarding. I love that part of the work. Okay, great. Okay, so now uh, come a little harder. Um, we understand that row offices are run by rules set by our state legislators. So what are the requirements set by them for the controller, controller's office? Uh, it it's affects every aspect of what we do. So for example, um, I sit on the retirement board with the commissioners. We are required by law to provide a pension for county employees. That's by statute. So that is just an example of hundreds that I could come up with. So people look at it and say, oh, you have this incredibly um, uh, strong pension plan, which is kind of a dinosaur. The reason we have it is because it's, you know, we like to take care of employees who have served the county for a long time, but we have it by statute. So that is a nearly $1 billion fund. We are compelled to provide for county employees. Um, I don't know that the county would provide that if we didn't have to by statute, but that is an incredible commitment that is um, mandated by uh, Harrisburg. Um, the good thing is we've done such a good job funding it um, that it takes pressure off the rest of the budget. 
Um, I, I hope the taxpayers appreciate how important that is. We have to do it and it's our duty to do it as best as we possibly can and keep it funded because it does take pressure off the rest of the budget. Okay. Um, you also mentioned about um, audit, right? Um, what okay. are the requirements for by state that's saying? So in, in the early 2000s, it, was, um, it became a requirement to audit the tax collectors. I think Bucks County has 55 tax collectors and that's an expensive undertaking. A tax collector can be 75 to 125 hours. That was mandated by Harrisburg, but no funding came with it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the audit or our controllers before me had to make it happen on their, within their budget. Um, we're also required to audit the district courts. The district courts can be, um, you know, they're, they're much less of an undertaking, but there's 17 in the county. So um, it's still a big commitment on our part and it, it takes up a lot of manpower and it takes up a lot of payroll. And that too is mandated by Harrisburg. And um, how about the row offices? Um, the, the row offices are not a requirement and that is something that had kind of gone dormant before I was elected and um, sworn in. And I'll bring an example up here. Since I've been in office, um, we have audited tax claims, recorder of deeds, uh, prothonotary, coroner, uh, sheriff, those are not mandated, but they are very, that's where I wish we could really concentrate. Um, that would be more beneficial to the office holders and it would be more beneficial to the tax collectors or the taxpayers, excuse me. Those are massive undertakings because they haven't been done in years, in some cases, decades, and I'm not exaggerating there. Those can be 1,800 to 2,100 hours. Um, that's where I wish we could really concentrate, but we still have to do the tax collectors and we still have to do the DJs. Okay. Wow. So how many auditors do you have? Uh, I think we have six auditors on staff, one supervisor and one um, manager. So I think that that would make eight. Wow. So but, for but that it's auditing. we could use more. Um, the theme here would be consistent with school districts. This feels like an unfunded mandate. Oh, okay. Um, you have mentioned that um, through your auditing work, it could be a textbook for row offices or whoever to improve their operation. So could you cite a couple examples? Um, well, the audits are published on the, on the um, uh, we publish them on the county website. So for example, they can be mundane things like um, a mail record. And that might not seem like a lot, but it's, you know, we don't want anything falling through the cracks. So um, when the current row office holders took over, we did some, um, we started the audit process of the prior office holders. And as, um, you know, deficiencies in operation became apparent, we brought that to their attention right away. Um, and in some cases, and I'm speaking to Judy and Robin here, they picked up on it as quickly as we did. You know, here's how we can tighten up operations. So that audit provided a, um, a service to the current office holders to see how to do things properly. Okay, wow. So um, I remember you came to Doylestown Dem meeting uh, a couple months ago and I asked you, um, what will be a major concern for the county in the future? You said, tax claims. So can you elaborate? Well, the commissioners have acted on that pretty quickly. Tax claims is now being merged with treasurer, which was a big improvement in efficiency. Um, okay. Did I say tax claims or, I just wanna be clear about what I had mentioned at that Doylestown meeting. Um, I remember it as being tax claim, but I could be wrong. Um, so what would you think is the, what do you think is the, a, a, a big uh, alarm from your auditing work for the county government that uh, public um, should be aware. The, the biggest, well, the, audit, the biggest thing would be the unknowns. I mean, we are always looking for fraud. We're always concerned about fraud. And, you know, as the controller, that's what we're, we're looking out for. But every example we have of catching someone, so for example, wage theft, um, we feel like there's other cases out there that we want to pursue. 
um, and we're not aware of them, but um, you know, we have to be vigilant and we have to be aware of fraud. Um, I know we don't, we want to have the best opinion of all our employees, but we have to believe that fraud does take place in the form of wage theft. And that's something we absolutely try to catch whenever we can. Okay. All right. Great. I, I you know, thank you for what you're doing and um, I'm going to move on to Robin. Thank you. Right. Okay. Robin, you are, everywhere so we pretty much know a lot about what you have done in your office but you also you said recently to me that you're one of the top revenue generators of the row offices right so you need your office you're right so your office bring in a lot of money and can you tell us about um all, all of that yes so last year in 2020 we collected a hundred million dollars now that $100 million um, is for fees. You know, we collect fees for affordable housing, for the judicial system, for the schools, the municipalities, the state and the county. So in 2020, which has been a huge revenue year for us, we've been putting in the general fund between 500 to 800,000 per month. Wow. So I'm very proud of that. What does that mean when you put in the general fund? Well, That's we working. write a check to the county, to the county's general fund, where uh, Neil can probably tell you the controller gets it and it's used for payroll, I'm guessing, Neil, and all kinds of county expenses, the general wow. fund. All right. Right, Neil? Um, Am I right? Absolutely. So uh, she has a revenue producing department. She uh, There's a fee on transactions or she would provide the verbiage better than, than uh, I could, but um, it's a revenue producing department and not all departments are. So everything that um, an efficient and productive recorder of deeds produces is invaluable to the county. So, you know, overwhelmingly the revenue is coming from millage and that's, you know, tax collection. Um, that's very predictable. Um, we know the number of parcels, we know the millage rate, the big one are the um, revenue producing rows and Robin happens to be in a revenue revenue producing row. So that additional funding is very important for the county. And this, the 2020 happened to be a huge year for us. And right now we're on pace to beat last year. We're beating last year in 21, which is remarkable. I don't know if it's gonna last, you know, the housing market, you know, there's not enough on the market here. We had a lot of refis last year, a lot. That has slowed down, but we have a lot of sheriff sales now. So like I said, we're beating uh, 20 right now. We're up wow. almost 3000 documents this month alone. The, uh, wow. com the commissioners always, and the department, the Rose, always need to be conservative in anticipating revenue. Um, you can get into a trap if you overestimate your revenue for the coming year during the budget process. So you want to be realistic and then you want it to come in higher. And I'm very realistic. I did not know this was going to happen in 2020. So, you know, but it did. And it's great for the county. It's, it's great for affordable housing. It's great for the state. It's great for everyone. As you mentioned about affordable housing, um, I know you've done so many uh, improvements in your office, but there are uh, the issue on the affordable housing and what you did with Judy about notary public. Can you share with, uh, with us? Yes, yeah, so um, because of the pandemic, Judy and I were more aware of our situation with the notaries. You know, Judy and I, we get into office. It takes a long time to figure out everything. So. I do the commissions for the notaries in my department. Then they would have to go across the street, go back through another security and go into Judy's office to sign what's called a signature card and pay another $4.25. We charge $38 for the commission. So when the pandemic happened and our buildings were closed down, I decided that I was still going to do those notary commissions because I wanted to keep the notaries working. So I started swearing notaries in, in, in an empty parking lot. And they would meet me there. I would do it Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then 
I spoke to Judy and I went ahead and did the signature cards for Judy as well. We have now um, taken that a step further, Judy and I, and now we're still doing the signature cards in my office and um, giving them over to Judy um, at the end of the day. And we're, we're collecting her money too. So the customer, the notary, only has to pay one fee. They only have to write one check or one tran charge transaction instead of having to write a check to the recorder of deeds and then a check to the pathonotary for $4.25. It was just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So now we've worked all that out to make it very, very easy for the notaries. And Judy and I are even going to go further. We're going to get even more modern and we're eventually going to do a signature pad so that Judy will just get her signatures electronically. That is one of our goals. Judy and I talk about this all the time. We believe in good government. What is good government? Good government is serving the people and continually progressing to do things better. That's terrific, Robin. Um, what is the most frequently asked question of you? Where is my deed? We get this question every day. Where is my deed? We paid our house off. The mortgage company, the bank told us you're holding it. And I think people think it's this beautiful thing like I do have in the office, but it's really like, you know, on a piece of paper, Xerox, and we do not have everyone's deed. Everybody gets their deed when they close their house. It comes two to four weeks after the closing. And you, we've either put them in our little lock boxes or our, you know, wherever we put important papers. And if uh, by chance one can't find their deed, we will always email a free one to our homeowners in Bucks County. Wow, that's Good to know. <laughs> I want to go back to affordable housing, Bonnie, because I didn't oh, yes, answer yes, that. I'm sorry. Yes, no, it's my yes. fault. I got so, I'm so into the notary thing. So when I took office um, in 2018, we somehow stumbled upon um, the fact that there was a law passed in 2012 that said that the recorder of deeds could collect more money, names and pages, and it would be for affordable housing. Well, Mr. Saffron, my pro, my um, you know the previous recorder of deeds, my predecessor, and Commissioner Martin decided we are going to keep that money for the general fund. So when we found this out, you know here we are. We're not doing what the law says we are supposed to do. So I went ahead and I did a resolution with the county commissioners because it had to be on a resolution on their agenda to start collecting that money for affordable housing, the way the law says. So we added a lot of money to affordable housing and I don't have it off the top of my head and I don't know if Neil knows either, but we collect millions of dollars in our office every year for affordable housing. And that's really important to me, um, not just as a Democrat, but you know, as a human being that I wanna make sure that we give every cent we can to help the poor people of our county. That's great, Robin. Thank you so much. So I'm going to now move on to Judy. Judy, you mentioned that your office is very busy. So what is the largest demand for your service? Yeah, we do so many services yeah. that fam we do about 11,000 civil cases and about the same number of family cases a year. So we get our biggest demands tend to be just basic civil cases. You know, someone has an automobile accident, one person sues the other person. And that, of course, with the pandemic was much lower than normal. People weren't driving, therefore they didn't get in accidents. But I think most of ours are, have been divorce, custody issues keep us extraordinarily busy. We have, we do writs of execution, we do satisfactions, we do judgments, we do writs for the sheriffs. It's, it's constant. It's just, it, the amount of work that comes in keeps with myself and my solicitor, 30 people busy. And we are busy. We're so busy that we're looking very desperately to find someone seasonally to help us with uh, filing. You wouldn't think we would need to help be help with filing because everything is on the viewer. 
But some of our judges um, are very set in their ways. I'll be kind about it. They, let's put it this way. We have, we have absolutely no room as of now for any more files in the warehouse. So that means all of our files from this year that need to be filed, we'll have to take out, I think the 2018s that are in the office and start piling them up on, against the wall. That usually under normal circumstances happens in, oh, November. We have like two months. It's, this is early. And a lot of it is because a lot of cases we haven't had jury trials. So as of now, we're, we don't know what cases, a lot of cases get settled two weeks before there's a jury trial. So we don't know if anything, it, how it's going to be in, uh, in June, June 1st, when we start having jury trials. So we have to keep paperwork, we have to keep records. Um, most, to be honest, most we get about 150 to 200 e-filings every day in civil court. Part of our issue with paper is in family court, protection from abuse is done by hand. It is an 11 page document. It's only three pages at the magistrate, but our judges, it's 11 pages. There's a lot that has to go on there. You have to ask, are there firearms or other weapons in the house? We have to know if there's minors. Um, it, it gets very complicated. And one issue we have is in some cases, these become revolving door cases. They're back. The, um, they'll vacate the order because they made up this week. Um, then they're back again a few months later. And our judges do have a statute that the defendant can be charged the court costs, but they're loath to charge them. But getting a perfect example is last month. Last month was a record. We had 96 petitions for protection from abuse. That does not count contempts. Today at protection from abuse court, we had 31 and I don't know how many, I think 10 to 12 contempt cases on top of it. That is a lot to get ready for judges. It's so, a lot. So Judy, so. Right, Judy. So um, one of the things that I think that it's not your job, but because you are so intimately involved in supporting the court system. So do you think, um, first of all, our court system provides sufficient protection for people who are seeking um, protection for whether from domestic abuse or what have you? I think that our judges are very attuned to the problems. I think that if they, they try very hard if they err to err on the side of safety and caution, um, none of us want to see what happened a few years ago. Um, the Mancuso family, my children grew up with the mother of this child. And a lot of that is because a lot of our judges come to become judges without having a lot of family court experience before they get there. And they're kind of like dumped into family court. And I think at this point, everyone is working very hard to err on that side. Sometimes there's just more than, than anyone knows about and we do the best we can. My staff is extremely patient. During the first months of the pandemic, our protection from abuse coordinator was having people out in the main lobby, making sure they could fill out forms and getting them to judges. Um, it is our job to make sure the forms are filled out, um, confidentiality. This, the law was passed um, about three months before I came into office. And it, January 1st that year, we had a new confidentiality form that has to be filled out. We had to train the bar association so the attorneys knew they had to put this form in. Mm -hmm. It's it's a lot, and I think we do this to protect privacy. We do a lot to protect people and privacy. Great. Well, thank you. I know it's a very complex system and many moving parts, right? And you it's have to lot. service all. Right. Right. It's so I'm now going to move. Okay. Well, I'm going to move on because um, um, we probably have like 
less than 15 minutes for our session. So I wanna move on to the questions that I can address to all three of you. And um, see the county government and the row offices have been under Republic Republican control for years, right? And many of the row offices that you are currently holding the, the office were treated as a, a patronage job. Yes. Right? yes. So can you briefly explain how you are operating differently from your predecessor. So I'll, I'll start with Neil and then up and then Judy and Robin. So Neil. Um, well, I mean, I'm hiring the most qualified people um, in, in all cases and um, whether they be a Democrat or a Republican, we're going with credentials, um, recommendations, uh, interview, and capability, and uh, we make no distinction. So we're looking for the best, most productive, most effective employees. Um, these are taxpayer dollars, and um, the standards have to be extremely tight. And no one in our office is getting a free ride. You know, if you if you join the controller's office, you're working. We're a very productive office. Does that address the issue? Judy? I think my office, when I came in, had some of the most, uh, the highest level of patronage people in it. And some moved to other departments. But like Neil, Neil says, I don't look to see how they're registered if they've, or if they're even registered to vote. I look at their credentials. I look at their ability. I also have them have more than just myself in an interview. I make sure the deputy, whether it's civil or family are there for the interview because they have can ask sometimes even more detailed questions than I can. I do not have a lot of staff turnover, truthfully. Um, some of my staff, most of my staff have been there 20 years. Some, I had um, the woman who was doing our, um, all of our stuff in the warehouse, she retired after 41 years. So working for the county is a good job. So we do have a good quality pool of people usually to choose from. And it's just looking to see who meets the qualifications. And also in my office, who will fit into the office, get along with other people in the office. Because people in my office kind of have to work collaboratively. So you need people who can do that. How about you, Robin? So Bonnie, I'm understanding the question as what I'm doing differently than my predecessor. Okay. So um, I've taken politics out of the office, meaning that my predecessor would give all the new home listings that have sold to the Republicans only. I decided to give it to everybody and not print it, email it. So that's another thing that I've done differently. Uh, my predecessor in 2017, he spent over $16,000 on paper and ink. I kept lowering it to where I'm now down um, to a little over $5,000 and I'm doing more business than he did. So that helps with the environment and the money. My predecessor had bank accounts. I told you all how much money comes through our department, getting no interest whatsoever. So that was one of the first things I did. I shopped around for a bank and now we get interest and that amounts to thousands of dollars every year. Again, that goes for the county. Um, we stopped mailing people extra deeds. And that's another thing that I did. I've really gone you know, all out electronic on, on everything. The other thing, um, and Neil's very aware of this, my predecessor was running a, um, 5013C out of my department. And, you know, we don't do that. We work for the county, we do recorder of deeds work, and that's what we do. So we stopped all of those things that were not relative to um, our department and to the county. What does that mean? What do you mean by he was running a 501C3 out of the recorder? He was using, um, oh, Neil would like to answer this. Okay, Neil, go ahead. <laughs> um, th this is in the audit that we produced, but um, the language in there is very dry. But in the plainest terms, he was running a um, overtly political operation out of the recorder of deeds mm -hmm. office 
and at times using county resources to help run that um, 501c3. Wow, is that illegal? So I had to find, I had to find real work for these people to do because when I came in there, all of this work was gone. And I had to, you know, reestablish jobs for people. I had, I had one woman in my office crying that by 10 o'clock in the morning, she was done and there was nothing for her to do. So I had to really come up with, you know, reorganizing the office and making sure that we had a finance department that really did the finances because it was just all over the place. You know, and of course, other things that I've done, as you know, the deed books, finding the historic deed books on the floor in the warehouse, I think they would have just left them there forever. I mean, you know, that's just absolutely awful. So I think that people don't realize how political the courthouse and the whole system was. My employees thought that they were required to either work the polls or hand out uh, political literature for the Republican Party to keep their jobs. I mean, they were like shocked the first year there was an election and they said to me, well, what do you want me to do? I said, I want you to go vote, <laughs> you know, that's all. And they said, well, don't you have somebody? I said, no, there's no politics in my office, period. Before yeah. Diane Marseglia got there, you had to be a Republican to work in the courthouse. You would get your application to work over at Republican headquarters, yep. but Diane, put an end to that and made the jobs public, put, you know, made, made them do the right thing because, you know, I have my own personal story and there's lots of stories out there, people who tried to get jobs in the courthouse and couldn't because they were Democrats. And that's why you see a lot of people who've been Republicans, registered Republicans because they couldn't get work in the county. That has all changed. Wow. It's wonderful. Wow. Um, I mean, I mean, wonderful. I mean, it's wonderful to hear that you all have made the changes and that, uh, that Commissioner Marseglia did that originally yeah. when we got there in 20, uh, 2008, she just put her foot down and I guess they were afraid of the press back then because we really had a presence with the press then since I worked for her, the press would come by every day and Diane would open the doors, let them in. And, you know, it was really a lot of fun. I think that's another thing. Um, I get a lot of press calls, um, questions, especially when there's a case that's very public. And when I can give information freely, I'm happy to do so. But I also can speak with them and, and tell them you need a right to know request. The judge has to make this decision. They know I'm telling them the truth. I'm not trying to hide something or not give them information or act in some kind of hady cavey manner. And it seems like before they were always suspicious because they didn't always get the right, get any answer, least of all the right answer. And I think that is a real problem and had been a real problem in the courthouse. Um, people deserve answers. You know, um, I generally, when we host the uh, Vote Local uh, series, we always end up with asking a question about why is it important to be in, uh, having the Democrat in office? Right, and I think the three of you just told us through this whole hour why it's important to have a Democrat who believes in public service, who believe in helping people who need help. Um, so I don't have to ask that question, but I do wanna ask um, in your capacity, so how do you address diversity and racial e equality issue in your office? All right. Um, I, I can answer that when I came sure. into my office, everybody looked like me. There's no other way I could put it. Everyone looked like me. And I had one part-time per diem person of color. And as soon as, and she was probably one of the best workers I've ever seen. And when there was an, when we had an opening and a chance to hire, I offered her that position. I outwardly, I also tried to recruit um, someone who is bilingual. We get a lot of people who come, at least into my office, whose their English is not great. Mm -hmm. They can speak English, but reading and interpreting um, anything from getting a passport to if they've received an eviction notice and now they have to appeal 
the magistrate's decision, they need someone who can explain to them. We can't tell, give them advice. We're not lawyers, but we can't explain how to fill the forms out or which form they might need. And having someone who can speak Spanish really is important. So I'm constantly, when I get put out a, um, the few times I get to look for someone for a, a physician, I really, I do look for people who make my office more diverse because the county is more diverse than people who just look like me. Judy, what you're forgetting though, is that we are union. So yeah. it makes it extremely difficult. So we yeah. have employees, you know, who've been there forever. Mm -hmm. And when we do have an opening, we have to interview any right. union employee from a different department that wants the job. And right. we have to, by union contract, we have to take the most senior union person that applies if they're qualified. So Correct. this limits us from even going outside the county. And it makes it very difficult to, you know, mix our departments up because we have been given, you know, this union base that is a Republican base. I mean, I have the old coroner's sister-in-law in my office. I have my old first deputies, the old first deputies from um, not the guy before me, but the guy before him, I have his niece. We can just go down the line that everybody I have almost in my office is from somebody in the Republican Party. And I then when I have an opening, I have to, like I said, I've got to take the union person that wants that job, the mo one who has the most seniority. So it makes it very difficult to bring anyone in from outside the county. It, it is. Robin's 100% right. I have a constable's wife. I have a former magistrate's wife and I guess in law. I have a judge's nephew. I have another niece. Judy, I think we, we get the picture. <laughs> I think we get the picture. So Neil, do you have something to yeah, Neil? I want to take this first of all, my my narrative is very consistent with uh, Judy and Robin. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of tight relationships within my office. But I want to take this in a tight, slightly different direction. Um, and that is ESG. I sit on the retirement board. So we have a fund, it's almost near 950 million. And you might say, where is this going? Thanks to Commissioner Harvey, we um, have moved towards ESG investing and that is environmental, social and governance. Mm -hmm. And that is the county putting its money where its mouth is. So it is a new direction that never would have happened with the composition or the prior composition of the retirement board. Um, I, really, Commissioner Harvey was fairly new and he pushed for it very quickly. We want returns. There's no doubt about that. We want returns. We want um, absolute returns without good governance, without social or environmental concerns, not at all. We want to balance the two. And we ran it by our investment manager and he was all for it. And they did a lot of research and they've helped us move in that direction. That's something that would not have happened without uh, Dems in charge. Okay, great. So um, this hour had gone by so quickly. So I just wanna wrap this up and thank you the three of you for participating tonight. And you are the first wave of Democrats being elected into our county government, right? So, and you're the trailblazer. You are showing us what real Democrats in office can do. So, and we're very proud of you and thank you for your hard work. Um, back to Judy, Judy. Okay. Thank, yes, thank you, Bonnie. Thank you. Okay, so we've got a, just a couple more slides to, to wrap things up here. Uh, so hopefully you've been, learned more about Buck's government and enjoyed meeting our guests virtually. Uh, now, how can you get more involved? Well, there's several things that you can do. You can volunteer for a local government committee, either the county or the townships. There's applications online. You find a committee that interests you and, and, and join. Uh, you can attend a local Democrats meeting. If you go to Bucks County Democratic Committee's website, there is a calendar of meetings. Uh, just find that and find the one that's closest to you. Uh, you'll learn so much more about the comings and goings in your neighborhood. Uh, volunteer for local candidates. As we've heard tonight, the row offices are up. 
Some of them are up for election, a primary in, on May 18th. Uh, school board seats are up and also judges are running. You can learn more about that at your local democratic meeting as well. Uh, volunteer with other activist groups, whether it's Rise Up Doylestown's Bucks Voices, or as recommended, the Women's Forum, uh, you can join those groups and come on out and vote on primary day, on the election day, May 18th. And then again, in the general election on November 2nd, go to votespa.com to see, make sure if you're getting your mail-in ballot or you're gonna need to go vote in person. So a special thanks to tonight's guest, Robin, Judy, and Neil. We very much enjoyed having you join us this evening and all the efforts you put into your video and rehearsal and just getting us all that little information that we needed along the way. I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Doylestown Democrats and everyone who has donated to this series. Thank you so much for your cash donations. It does help. And uh, to our production and promotion team, Jeff Kotskull, Kevin Green, Carl Herring, Melissa Brangan, Connor O'Hanlon, Jenny Robinson, Karen Forbes, and a special shout out to Bonnie Chang, who <laughs> jumped in in the middle of the series, or kind of somewhere in the middle of the series, and elevated the level of this uh, conversation. Bonnie, you've been fantastic. Thank you so much, so, so much. You've done a great job. Your questioning is superb. There's no one better, better verse than you, so thank you for that. <laughs> Yep, yep, but we are fortunate. We have uh, uh, the D Doylestown Dem Chair, Connor O'Hanlon, will be joining us on May 23rd to interview, uh, where we will be interviewing uh, State Senator Steve Sanancero and former State Representative Wandy Allman. You can sign up on the DoylestownDemocrats.com website. So we hope to see you then, and thanks everyone for joining us. We, we enjoy having you. Take care. Yeah.